during the night, the only thing you see is fusion. Fusion goes on everywhere in the universe. Arguably, it's the easiest thing nature does. It's the process which powers the sun. All life on Earth gets their energy from the sun. What we're trying to do is we're essentially trying to recreate what's going on up there, down here. Humanity has been dreaming to be doing the same thing on Earth. Fusion is really difficult. <laughs> For fusion to happen, we need three things. We need high density, we need high temperature, and we need good confinement. That is to say, we need our fuel to stay inside the box that we're putting it in. The sun does this through gravity because it's so big. So how do you deal with such a medium on Earth? Fusion is, is the holy grail of, of energy production. Uh, the, the, its biggest downsides is really hard. The principle of fusion that is also used by the sun is to fuse light nuclei and as a result you are getting heavier nuclei. Hydrogen is isotopes are deuterium with one proton and one neutron and tritium with one proton and two neutrons. So they collide with a very high energy and temperature around 150 million degrees, which is 10 times higher temperature than in the center of the sun. And they can fuse, so we have helium element and we have one neutron. So this is the most important part of the reaction because neutron takes 80% of all energy of the fusion reaction. When we have two hydrogen nuclei, they weigh more than the helium nucleus that they become when you crash them together. And that extra mass has to go somewhere. And so what you've done is you've converted mass into energy. And that mass turned into energy. This is literally E equals mc squared happening. Energy can become matter, and matter can become energy. And that's, the, that's fusion. That's how you get the energy out. What we need to get this actual fusion reaction to happen is we need our two initial reactants to get close enough that they will actually fuse into our final product. Unfortunately, this is fairly difficult, and the main reason for that is that our two initial reactants are both positively charged. And in the same way that two positive ends of a magnet will repel each other, so will they. So the particles have to have a certain speed while they collide and in order to overcome the Coulomb force, because particles are positively charged, therefore it's, it is a counter-directed Coulomb force, and this must be overcome in, uh, in order to come close enough to each other that the uh, strong interaction force is taking over and then fusion is happening. Stars do this with gravity, so they're just super big, super dense, and the atoms naturally come together and form helium. Unfortunately, that is not something which we can reproduce here on Earth, so that's why it's really, really difficult. There are a number of different approaches. Most of those still rely on what we call magnetic confinement, which is keeping the plasma confined by using magnetic fields. There's also inertial confinement fusion, where you have a little tiny mini pellet of fuel and you fire a massive laser at it. So some of the biggest lasers in the world are working on inertial confinement fusion. Instead of having high pressure, we have really, really, really high temperature. So the core of the sun is at 15 million degrees Celsius. And to get fusion to work, at least for us, our method of doing it with the tokamak, we've gotten it up to 150 million degrees Celsius. So that's 10 times hotter than the core of the sun. Heat allows us to make sure that the particles are moving really, really fast. And when they're moving really, really fast, they're more likely to crash into each other and fuse. The temperatures that you need to do this in a gas mean that you take your gas and you actually change what state of matter it is in. It's no longer a gas, it's actually a plasma. And a plasma is the fourth state of matter from the basic ones, where you start with a solid, add a little bit of energy, you get a liquid, add a bit more energy, you get a gas, and then if you add even more energy to that, you end up with a plasma. Plasma is ubiquitous in the universe. It makes up everything. If you look up into the sky and you see something, more than likely you're staring at plasmas. 
and the fun one with plasma means that your whole gas becomes charged and that means you can hold it in place with magnetic fields. So over the development of the past decades, two concepts have basically survived this Darwinistic process and that's the tokamak and the stellarator. And both have in common that the magnetic field is ring-shaped. But there's, there are subtle differences between tokamak and stellarator, not just the name. Now, tokamak is a Russian word and essentially it just means a donut. Uh, that, that is not exactly what, that is not what Rus Russian for donut is, but a tokamak is essentially a donut-shaped chamber. So a tokamak is a Russian acronym and uh, it means just in Russian language, um, toroidal chamber and magnets. So it's very, very straightforward. And so it has nothing to do with the tomahawk. Never, never confuse that. Jet, which is the biggest uh, operating tokamak in the, in the world currently. So this is the jet in-vessel training facility. The actual jet experiment is through a big, thick wall over there. Um, JET is, is the, the largest operating um, fusion experiment in the world. We don't put power on the grid. It's an experiment run, for, uh, run by Eurofusion. You can see it's kind of got a circular shape. It's quite hard to see from this angle, but it's, 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 a, it's a donut shape, at least on the inside. And that's key for fusion. So if we were in the real JET um, tokamak, well, the, the vacuum vessel would look much as you sort of see so where this robot is, here you'd have about 150 million degrees, which is what you need for the fusion reaction. And then just under my feet, under here, you have special pumps that are at four degrees above absolute zero. So you have the hottest place in the galaxy right here and the coldest place on Earth just a few meters away down there. The materials challenges for fusion are substantial. The heat loading on, on just the average heat loading around that first wall is around about 10 times, 10 times what the space shuttle tiles have to deal with on re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere. That's the average loading, but then there, there's part of the tokamak wall at the top and the bottom, it's, they're called the diverters, where there's an even higher heat load, which is about 10 times that again, so around about roughly 100 times what the Space Shuttle has to deal with on re-entry. Yet, the Space Shuttle takes minutes, order of minutes, to go through the Earth's atmosphere, yet a fusion reactor needs to operate for years. As if the, this heat loading challenge on its own weren't enough, then the tokamak is operating in fundamentally a, a nuclear environment. We have the neutrons. In principle, neutrons are good for fusion. We get the energy uh, to produce electricity from those neutrons. But the problem is that these neutrons also add a lot of damage to the materials that are inside of the reactor. So what the neutrons do to the materials is that they uh, degrade their properties. So they kind of break them, they make them more brittle. Without the neutrons, the material in the first wall is ductile, it's bendy, right? It's a bit like, if I was strong enough, a bit like this fork would be, um, which is good because the, the tokamak vessel has to, has to put up with loads of mechanical stress. If I have neutrons bombarding um, a metal like this fork, then it becomes brittle. So if I was strong enough, it would just snap, which is clearly bad. We are still uh, working on discovering uh, new materials that are going to be part of the of the future fusion reactor, and also enhancing the current materials in order that they uh, have some special properties in order to be used in the in the future machines. What you need to do to create a fusion, to create a mini sun, is you need to create a very hot gas and keep it away from the walls. And the way you do that is um, you create a, a torus, a donut shape, you put the gas in the middle and then you've got magnetic coils surrounding the vessel and that keeps the gases away from the sides of the walls and it just allows the gases to spin around and get hotter and hotter until we can get them to fuse and produce lots of energy. Using the plasma itself as a magnetic field coil, we run a huge current, about 3 million amps, through this plasma and that itself generates the magnetic field twist to keep it all confined. The stellarator, in contrast, does not need strong current in the plasma and the uh, magnetic field is created by the external magnetic field coils only. But you have to pay a price. Uh, the external magnetic field coils have to have a shape, a non-trivial shape, so they look already more complicated. It's a a ring-shaped magnet, but it looks like it has fallen off the truck and the truck went over it several times. 
And so it's actually physics frozen in. So you could, can see the physics that uh, was done over one generation of researchers. It is the aesthetics of physics. And uh, frankly speaking, it also looks nice. What if we built a device of that scale, maybe a little larger, used the most advanced technology at the time uh, that's available to us, and try for a big tokamak? And that's what we got with the ITER project, which is now going, being assembled in France. The role of ITER is really to demonstrate both the principle and the technology and the safety aspects on a device which has the size of a reactor. After that, the industry will have the recipe, if you wish, to construct the reactor of the futures and to make that uh, a series production. So it's maybe the last experimental facility because there are many parameters that uh, we can adjust and to optimize the process. The plasma inside uh, the tokamak or inside a nuclear fusion reactor is extremely hot and dense and as you come towards the edge of the reactor, it's relatively cooler and less dense and uh, as a result, there are these huge gradients from the center to the edge, which uh, are the source of, of many transport processes for the plasma basically to, to sigh and heave and uh, shift and transport itself from the hot core towards the colder edges. This is also the case in, for example, the sun. It already sees a lot of these uh, transport processes and when you reach the edge you see even solar flares which are these huge voluminous ejections of particles because the sun's surface is not very stable. And this is something similar to what happens in a nuclear fusion reactor and it can happen under various uh, ways. Uh, some of it is called turbulent transport. All turbulence is not bad. We need turbulence, but we don't want too much of it. We control the plasma turbulence by controlling the amount of heat and uh, particles uh, that we supply to replenish the plasma and uh, by controlling uh, its environment, basically the magnetic field that encapsulates the plasma, that keeps the plasma together. It turns out we need strong magnetic fields. So we actually need uh, two types of magnetic field. Uh, the first one happens in what we call the toroidal direction. This is following the shape of the torus around. But that wouldn't be quite enough to keep it completely confined. So what we do is we actually want a magnetic field as well in what we call the poloidal direction. And that sort of introduces a twist. So in the Dokamak, we have uh, several types of magnets. We have uh, first the toroidal field coil, but we have also the central solenoid, which is used to power the plasma. We have also the polyhedral field coils, which are used also for the shaping of the, of the plasma, but also to adjust the position of the plasma inside the vacuum chamber. We have also the correction coils, which are there to uh, correct a bit, uh, to position the plasma and to, to keep it in, uh, in shape. The development for the manufacture of this TF coil has lasted more than seven years. One of these magnets is in the range of 80 million euros. We have manufactured 18 coils. We need 18 coils. They are not on the shelf magnets, obviously. For example, the Toriotal field coil is a 17 meter high, 350 tons, that has been fully uh, designed for this specific experiment, which is ITER. So these 18 blocks that you see surrounding the center here, they are the supports for the toroidal or D-shaped vertical magnets that will surround the uh, vacuum vessel. And in the end, when this is going to be removed, there will be a massive, powerful magnet on the inside. It's the central solenoid. This will be the strongest magnet ever built by mankind. Well, actually, we are now in the assembly hall of Vita. This is where a lot of activity is happening right now. And this is where we put together the nine sectors of the vacuum vessel before they are being actually lifted into the tokamak pit and fully assembled over there. And from a manufacturing point of view, it's very difficult to be able to assemble it, place together with the tolerances, let's say, from millimeters to centimeters. So there is a, a very high precision for the very large scale. And once everything is put together, we will actually have then the fusion machine in here. And this is going to be where the fusion reaction takes place.
The machine is about 100 cubic meters of volume. That's about the same as two shipping containers. And yet we fill it with an amount of gas that at room temperature pressure would barely fill a teaspoon. Deuterium and tritium. Deuterium and tritium. A tiny bit of, of this. In ITER it will be less than a gram. One gram of deuterium-tritium mixture is, has a coal equivalent of 10 million gram of coal burned. And um, the simplest very reason, because if you, coal, uh, if you burn coal, you have a chemical process. You are oxidizing coal, nothing else. And everything is happening in the shell of the, of the atom. Uh, whereas fusion is a uh, nuclear process, and there we are releasing the strong force of the nucleus of the, of the atoms. If you have a one gigawatt power station running with coal, you need 10,000 tons of coal per day. And the CO2 is blown into the atmosphere, of course. For a fusion power station of the same output power, you need less than one kilo, kilogram deuterium tritium mixture. And that's crazy. So you can carry it with your own hand into the power station. So it's, it's nice to drink some uh, fusion fuel, <laughs> because uh, actually uh, when we talk about um, isotopes of hydrogen, um, like deuterium and tritium. Deuterium we can easily and routinely produce uh, from water. So, for example, in one cubic meter of sea water, we have like 33 grams of deuterium. With tritium, it's more complicated. It's quite rare. Uh, tritium is not available on Earth because tritium, uh, as a hydrogen isotope, is an unstable isotope. So it falls apart, it decays for something like 15 years. And so therefore there, there are no tritium reservoirs, of course, on Earth, because the Earth is way older than 15 years, as we all know. Uh, so therefore you must generate the tritium. But the other cool thing that happens in the blanket, as the neutron um, slows down, if you put lithium in the blanket, the neutron hits the lithium and breeds tritium. It creates its own fuel. And so we take the fuel that we've made in the blanket and recycle that and put it back into the reactor. So at some point it can become a self-fueling uh, machine. The most important parameters for fusion, it's safe and clean. Fusion is safe because there is no risk of any uh, runaway reaction. The fusion reaction is so difficult to get going that the first thing it wants to do is just stop. So as soon as there is any problem into the, into the machine, as soon as anything goes wrong, the reaction will stop by itself. So there is no risk that the reaction continues without any control. If things go bad, let's say if, let's say if something like gets wrong with an reactor, there's no explosion. There's no critical event where things go bad. Energy just dissipates um, and it's fine. And the fuel themselves, they're not, even though they're radioactive, the half-life, meaning how long it takes for them to slowly die down, is very short by comparison to like uh, stuff we use in fission. So waste is a big issue as soon as we talk about nuclear energy, because this is one of the biggest challenges that nuclear fission has to deal with. Uh, nuclear fusion is also a nuclear process, so it does produce some waste. The big difference between fusion and fission is that fusion doesn't produce the long-lived waste which you have to store for hundreds of thousands of years. So you do produce waste, but the deal with a fusion reactor is that you can design it so that after 100 years or so, you can start going into the reactor again and reprocess the material. So that's a very big difference because you don't have to care or to worry about very long storage of waste. In the control room, a group of people all click go at the same time, which means everyone's agreed that they are ready to go. Well, the first thing you do is you evacuate that vacuum vessel. You pump it and you get rid of all the gas in it. Then we're starting to charge our magnetic system around the vacuum chamber. You put a tiny amount, about a postage stamp worth of fuel, you inject that in multiple areas. And then you switch on a solenoid which is in the middle of the, of the tokamak. And this, by the magic of physics, creates an electric field in, this, in the donut. The hydrogen gas, deuterium and tritium, starts swirling around inside the tokamak. Then our first heating system kicks on and it zaps this gas into a plasma and the whole thing starts swirling around the tokamak. So then you use the, the, the RF heating systems and another heating system called neutral beam. You fire in beams of particles and that gets you from the sort of 1 to 10 million degrees up to the 100, 150 million degrees. And then the process 
of fusion starts. The particle can knock each other sufficiently fast so they fuse and then they produce energy. Then you have lit a sun inside your cage. Now neutrons are neutrally charged so they don't, they're no longer captured by our magnets and they fly off and, and hit the wall. And in a reactor what you would do is you'd, you'd have what's called a blanket on the wall and as the neutron slows down in, in the blanket, it heats the metal. So all you do then is pass water through the hot metal, that water turns into steam, and then you take that steam, turn turbines, and produce electricity, just like turbines do in, in current power stations. Fusion is at an interesting stage right now because both in the public and in the private domain, there are a lot of things happening. ITER is finally being built and it's close to starting operations. And at the same time, we see a large number of, uh, of private companies starting. We have about 30 companies now, which uh, attract quite a lot of capital. Uh, and it's very interesting because they start uh, investigating new concepts, uh, more aggressive concepts. They, t they tend to take the kind of SpaceX approach where you take risk and you basically start, uh, you try, you fail, and then you start again. We are really at this stage where so many things start popping up, but an environment and an ecosystem about fusion is actually starting, which didn't used to exist like 10 or 15 years ago. There are a lot of people involved in fusion, and it goes from all fields. Obviously, we are the physicists, making sure that all the physics makes sense, how you analyze it, diagnose it and everything. Electrical engineers, we have mechanical engineers. Computational mechanics, find out element methods. Robotics. Uh, material properties. Uh, diagnostics, plasma operations. Fueling challenges. Mechanical engineers, electrical, software, mechatronics, civil. A really strong IT team. Three-dimensional design. The maintenance equipment. Material science. There are loads of technicians on site. Structural stability of heavily loaded structures. We have designers on site. Theory, modeling. Chemists. People that we have on site here who are pure physicists or pure engineers. It's actually quite small. The majority of people work somewhere in that gray area. And that's kind of representative of fusion, really, moving from a pure science and theory side of things to actually engineering the future. So within a tokamak like um, JET, um, there are quite a lot of things that needs uh, doing, um, especially during a shutdown phase. So at this stage, um, because of how radioactive it is within the talker bank, no one can actually ever go back inside. That is why robotics and like remote handling systems are so important. But what's special about how we go about doing things is that the robots are kind of avatars of us. So we control the robots as though we are within the reactors themselves. The robot, the remote side within the dangerous environment, and you have another robot which is the local side within a safe environment. So it's a copy of each other. So it's quite, it's, it's a melting pot of like nerds and geeks who really love robots and all want to apply it in um, the way of fusion energy. Yeah, it's a dream job. Like um, to be able to apply my interests and knowledge in this kind of direction, something that is important, something that is worthwhile, something that will benefit a lot of people is quite a, quite a good feeling to have and having fun along the way. So our machines are really high energy, they have um, really delicate components, they have the capacity to melt things. Um, so the diagnostics on the machine are important for measuring different aspects. Diagnostics uh, is the same like in medicine, you need to diagnose. The warning lights in your car are kind of diagnostics. The most important parameters for fusion is density of particles, so density of plasma in our case, it's temperature to which we can heat it up and uh, well there are many more parameters. The diagnostics are really important for learning how to run a tokamak. So some of them feed straight back into the control room and they affect the very next experiment that we do and some of them are collecting data for years-long experiments that are going to affect the next tokamaks that are being built. In probably the last decade or so, possibly slightly more than that, ago, uh, there have been lots of very interesting proposals for new machines and actually there's a huge amount that are in either the design or even the building stages right now. Whilst we've made massive advances in fusion, there is still a huge amount to do. Getting into fusion in the next 10-20 years is going to be 
probably one of the most exciting times because we are just at the point where we're get, we're, we are designing and starting to think about building the first reactors where we will actually put power on the grid. Wendelstein's having access to a brand new machine actually and such a, such a research device is typically operating 20 years and delivering uh, results that are important for the development of fusion. And so therefore, therefore Wendelstein Server X is the machine of the, uh, of the current young generation and the next generation of fusion scientists. There's the uh, demo project, STEP, which is uh, the UK's uh, prototype fusion power plant, um, as well as a number of others that are going on at this stage. And that's not something that we've ever been able to say before. There are many funded uh, opportunities in Europe, for example, there are many master degrees in different uh, European countries about nuclear fusion. There are also many funded PhD opportunities in Europe in different uh, research fields in fusion. The fusion community is tremendously international, but it, it, it has a mission to build itself, to grow, um, and to do that, it wants to be inclusive, it wants to give everyone the opportunity to be involved. So if you have the opportunity, get in touch with a, a tokamak or another fusion experiment and say, can I come along and have a visit? If you're at school or college, banter your, your teacher or instructor and say, please, can you organize a, a visit for us? There are many opportunities because we need people joining fusion and, and helping us uh, move forward towards creating fusion electricity for the future generations. So don't hesitate to, to find those opportunities online everywhere. There's also FuseNet, the European Fusion Education Network, and we do our best to coordinate fusion activity, education and training across Europe. Please just send us an email and we'll put you in touch with a, a, um, an event or an institution that, that you can access. We do not currently have any single technology or even mix of technologies that we can say will definitely provide sufficient energy for a growing population and a growing standard of living ad infinitum. And if we were to be able to make fusion a reality, that may well be true that we could have that security. There is 1.5 billion of, of people over the earth that don't have electricity. So you can imagine that they will be very keen to have electricity and that means essentially doubling the energy consumption uh, until uh, 2050, thereabout. You need power stations which don't take up a lot of space and don't rely on the sun to, to, to shine or the wind to blow. They can produce lots of power with no carbon and fusion does that. But at the end, you will need to have energy production that will be able to supply what you need when there is no wind and when it's dark or when even there is a cloud. You know, I might not live to see um, the full repercussions of uh, global warming and stuff like that. Even though we are in it now, I can still say I'm living comfortably. I have the privilege to say that, but future generations might not. Um, and that worries me and that is something that is definitely worth fighting for. Um, a future where people can live as I do currently or even better. I'd like my grandkids to be able to visit the moon and I'd like my great grandkids to visit their kids on Mars and maybe even in orbit of Venus. But in order to do that, we need power supplies we just don't have today. And that's what fusion is. It's one of them. And as far as I know, it's the only one that we really have a credible hold on right now. So if humanity is going to uh, continue over the centuries to come, it will have sooner or later uh, we'll be dealing with fusion energy because it's limitless, because it's clean, and because at the end we have proven that it actually works. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. Um, so you know, but it's worth it. This, 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 this could change. This is a game changer for, for humanity. It's not an easy thing. So it's one of the most difficult fields in physics, and uh, one uh, and the machines we have to build uh, are among the most complicated machines in the world, for sure. So therefore we need good people. We better put all the required effort on it sooner than later because we will need it.